Chapter Twenty of Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The end of an arid August witnessed the opening of the Merks Munitions Works in the enlarged and renovated buildings over by the swamp. For months past, Innisfield had enjoyed a vastly increased volume of business which the new enterprise had brought to town, and now a small army of workers had taken possession of the barrack-like buildings erected by the company in the immediate neighbourhood of the plant. Mrs. Buckthorn's protest, with its red ink signatures, had been duly forwarded to the company. Its receipt had been promptly acknowledged by the secretary of the Merck's munitions works, who stated in a letter to Mrs. Buckthorn that its contents, as noted, would receive the earnest consideration of the stockholders. At a subsequent meeting of the Ladies' Aid Society, the damning fact was disclosed that a document of quite a different sort had been sent to the new concern, signed by the businessmen of the community, who had banded together to furnish substantial inducements to the Merck's Munition Works to locate in our midst. It was a burning, scarifying shame, agreed the ladies, and Mrs. Buckthorn, who, as the head and front of the movement, naturally took the lead in the spirited discussion which followed, spoke strongly of Belial, and mentioned the Merck's company as an instrument in the hands of the devil, which somehow mollified everybody's feelings. It was thought to be a truly providential circumstance that the Reverend George Pilgrim would open his evangelistic campaign on the very day the Merck's Munitions Company began its operations, and when, in his initial sermon, preached on a hot August night to the fluttering of innumerable fans, the Reverend Pilgrim alluded to the coincidence in picturesque terms, the women leaned forward in pleased attention, still cooling themselves busily, whereat the Reverend Pilgrim suddenly shot up to the full height of a substantial stool placed behind the pulpit, and leaned far out over the desk, gesticulating with energy. "'Put down those fans!' he shouted. "'I'm not preaching to fans, baseball or any other kind. "'Put them down, I say. "'Some of you folks will be so hot in hell some of these days. "'You'll holler for a drop of water to cool your tongues. "'But you won't get it unless you repent and be converted.' and there won't be any fans there. Talk about munitions workers. I tell you, you've all got to get busy. Take off your kid gloves and get into working clothes. You can't raise a blister with the sort of blank cartridges you've got in this church. I know your sort. You can't fool me, and you can't fool God either. They tell me there's a munitions factory started just outside of your dead old town. There's nothing dead out there. Those men are working like devils in hell to make stuff to kill men's bodies. But you, what have you been doing all these years to save men's souls? I counted fifty saloons in this town today, and six houses of ill fame and a hundred loafers. I haven't counted the hypocrites yet, nor the liars, nor the religious fakers. Maybe you think there aren't any. <laughs> God knows better. I shall know better after I've been here a week. It's my job to throw all such stuff on the junk pile, and I'm going to do it. God can't work with stiffs. He wants real live folks that ain't afraid of dynamite. We're going to need shrapnel in this town to blow up the entrenchments of the devil. And we're going to begin with the ministers and the elders and the deacons and the church members. That's where we're going to begin. And we're going to begin right now. The people in the pews derived a fleeting satisfaction from the sight of their pastor's pale, distressed face. Mr. Pettibone was pilloried on the platform in full view of his congregation. He had read from the Bible in his usual forensic style. His succeeding prayer had been earnest and spiritual, full of pleadings for the divine mercy and the leadings of the Spirit. 
but its phraseology had been formal and scriptural it had differed in no wise from the sort of prayer he had been wont to offer from what was popularly known as the sacred desk for many years past do look at mr pettibone whispered miss electa pratt to her neighbour mrs deaconess buckthorn and philora too ain't it funny i do hope and pray it's going to do em good responded mrs buckthorn piously but the attention of the ladies was suddenly arrested by the high explosive voice of the evangelist which appeared to be aimed directly at them with the effect of a bursting shell what sort of folks do i mean by hypocrites he bellowed you don't know eh <laughs> well i'll tell you what god means by a hypocrite and you pay attention to what i tell you or you'll wish you had some day every pious old duffer who keeps a corner grocery store but whose weights and measures have been fixed so as to bring in a few more measly pennies to his till know any of them every woman who teaches a sunday school class on sunday and gossips spitefully about her neighbours on monday tuesday and the rest of the week know any such every girl who draws her skirts aside from her soiled sisters on the street but stands ready to sell herself to the highest bidder who'll give her the right to put missus before her name ever hear of such a thing oh i see some of you folks grinning that's right laugh and be damned you thought i didn't get you and you're just mean enough to laugh when you see the other fellow hit god understands your sort you can't fool him not for a minute why there's more than fifty-seven sorts and varieties of hypocrites i'm not going to waste your time nor mine naming em but i'll tell you one thing my smiling friend and just you paste it in your hat unless you get down to brass tacks and corner that slippery slimy self if you don't hunt out your own particular brand of hypocrisy and yank it out root and branch you can't count yourself in the kingdom stop snickering long enough to take in the proposition right now you're either saved or lost ever think of that there's no rail fence between heaven and hell for you to roost on your minister never talked to you like this you're thinking you're dead right he never did and why because your churches make cowards of your settled pastors they ain't one of em between here and frisco that dares call his soul his own they've got the notion that their bread and butter depends on pleasing a lot of whining hypocritical church members and nothing short of an earthquake will shake em out of it how do i know this well i'll tell you i was the pastor of a church in a western town once and there was a rich brewer in my congregation used to locate of a sunday morning right down in a conspicuous pew in the centre aisle a big fat pompous looking chap he was worth a million or so and he had that church right where he wanted it i hadn't been there pastor a week before one of my elders warned me against the subject of temperance you've got to be careful mr pilgrim says he it won't do to antagonize mr so-and-so why do you know he contributes annually to the support of this church something like a thousand dollars we couldn't afford to pay your salary if it wasn't for so and so did i see the point you can bet i saw it all right i had a wife and three kids and i'd never understood the story of elijah and the ravens for a cent so i was mighty careful to skate around the extreme edge of the booze question never went near it for more than a year and then one sunday the spirit of the lord came upon me mightily i looked down from the pulpit and i saw that smug old sinner sitting there as complacent as a stuffed boa constrictor and i let out the thunders of sinai 
God spoke through me that day, and I ripped the booze question up the back. And then I told them the truth about the measly, cowardly church, and how they tried to put the muzzle on me, same as they had on all their other ministers. The Lord gave me utterance. In the middle of it, old so-and-so got up and stomped out of the church, and at the same minute I caught a glimpse of my wife's white, scared face. But I was free, thank God, and I stayed so. During the fervid appeal to sinners and the tumultuous singing of the closing hymn, during which a few impressionable girls and a sparse sprinkling of grey-headed men and women representing the backsliders came forward to grasp the evangelist's hand, Mr. Pettibone's controlled features manifested little of what he was thinking. He was dimly aware of various zealous members of his flock as they approached to congratulate Mr. Pilgrim on the success of his opening sermon. "'Tell you what, that's the stuff,' wheezed Deacon Scrimger. "'Sinners need rousing. Give em hell fire. I've been urging it on to our pastor right along, but shucks, he's one of them meechin fellers you was telling about. <laughs> "'Praise the Lord, you ain't afraid to speak right out,' said Mrs. Buckthorn, wiping the perspiration from her massive countenance. "'My, my, what a blessed season we're entering upon!' I can tell you some of your remarks fairly drawed blood, but there's those in our midst needs rousing, and I guess you ain't very wide of the mark when you begin with the minister. Mr. George Trimmer announced himself as so favourably impressed by Mr. Pilgrim's sermon that he was disposed to invite the evangelist to dinner on the following day. I should like you to meet the members of my family around the family altar said mr trimmer sonorously a few words from you on the subject of personal sanctification might serve to cheer us as we travel along life's pathway but mr pilgrim shook his head he never made social visits while at work he stated half an hour later as he turned to speak to mr pettibone he appeared to notice for the first time that gentleman's perturbed and pallid countenance. "'See here, Pettibone,' said Mr. Pilgrim, "'you don't want to take too seriously what I said tonight. "'I make it a rule to begin with heckling the ministers, "'because nothing rouses the people so effectively. "'Nothing personal about it, merely an opening gun. "'Wait and see me open up on those entrenched old hypocrites tomorrow night. "'I sized them up all right.' "'By the way, how long have you preached here?' Twenty years too long, I begin to think,' said Mr. Pettibone, with some bitterness. "'But what can I do? You were young when you broke your chains. Besides, not all ministers can be evangelists.' The Reverend Pilgrim smiled humorously. "'No, but many of them might be better employed than they are now,' he said. Mind, I don't mean you, though I'm not so sure now I've had a bird's-eye view of your field. Mr. Pettibone was stonily silent. The fact is, Pettibone, pursued Mr. Pilgrim with waning enthusiasm, the church as a whole could be handled more effectively without settled pastors. What is needed is an organisation of trained specialists paid by the church as a whole to do the work. Imagine one of these atrophied old churches treated to a course in spiritual dynamics by men like me. Men not dependent upon any one church for salary, answerable only to God and the central administration, which would have the care of all the churches. Get me? Mr. Pettibone drew his brows into a frowning line. I understand what you mean, yes, he assented coldly, but... Um, doesn't hit you very hard, eh? Well, I'm not surprised. It's tremendously revolutionary, I know, and would involve a complete overhauling of those respectable refrigerators we call theological seminaries. But it's bound to come. Mr. Pettibone strove to consider the matter objectively. 
does your scheme provide for the usual pastoral duties and such special sacraments as burials weddings and sick-bed ministrations he propounded mildly it would seem to me that in severing the bond between pastor and people much would be lost but mr pilgrim was experiencing the inevitable reaction due half an hour after preaching his versatile mind was now occupied with thoughts of the hot bath supper and bed awaiting him at his hotel he had already set down mr pettibone as one of a negligible type to be eliminated from his future scheme of things more particularly he had disliked mr pettibone's timid manner of addressing the deity the rev george pilgrim spoke loudly and familiarly to his god using the vernacular of the streets people sat up and listened to that sort of prayer it was original snappy full of piquant surprises and racy epithets pettibone he saw plainly was a hopeless duffer no use of wasting energy in argument with pettibone well good night said mr pilgrim definitely <clears throat> Uh, i should be glad to call on you tomorrow morning said mr pettibone for the purpose of conferring at eleven-thirty snapped the evangelist not a minute sooner his wife in her blue dressing-gown and pom-pom slippers was waiting for him in the study when the minister let himself into the parsonage half an hour later i thought you might be hungry she excused herself and the baby waked up and cried so i wasn't better go to bed my dear he advised i'm not at all hungry his eyes wandered toward his books she stood waiting expectantly her hand on the knob i think i'll read a while he said presently i'm i'm not sleepy she turned and came toward him swiftly impulsively and with a spent breath he opened his arms to receive her for a long minute neither spoke then she stood on tiptoe to kiss his pale face silas she said silas he patted her brown head awkwardly yes my dear i know i know better not say it but silas that man he led her unresisting to the door and gently closed it between them End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Harry, said Mrs. Schwartz, why didn't you go to the meeting last night? Mrs. Schwartz's rosy face wore a slightly anxious expression as she gazed across the breakfast table at her son, pleasantly engaged on his fourth muffin i didn't see you in the gallery or anywhere she concluded passing him the butter i didn't say i was going said harry watching a lump of butter sink luxuriously out of sight in the steaming interior of his muffin where did you go the young man gazed across the table at his pretty little mother well he said slowly i did have a hazy notion of stopping at the church i've been practising up with the choir you know yes i know you have she prompted him her blue eyes searching his face it was a wonderful sermon i never heard anything like it mm, murmured her son folding his napkin with unnatural care she followed him into the hall harry yes mother i heard something that worried me terribly last night you did he took down his straw hat from the rack and examined it with frowning intentness you don't want to let that sort of thing worry you mother he said there's a lot of old tabbies around this town who haven't anything better to do except oh yes i know but this was well never mind who it was i heard you've been seen talking to that french girl and that she well what of it what's the harm in speaking to a pretty girl oh harry what's the matter he repeated 
he knew i was taking french lessons with her father i told you so a long time ago he threw his hat up in the air and caught it twice the third time it struck the gas fixture with a jingling sound please listen harry you make me nervous throwing that hat around you'll break the globe if i do i'll buy another there was a boastful note in her son's voice which did not escape mrs schwartz then it's true she decided clasping her hands oh dear and i said i knew it wasn't i said you wouldn't think of doing such a thing as what why as marrying a foreigner harry burst into uproarious laughter that's what you did mother he accused her you're a great one to talk about marrying a foreigner now aren't you your father was born in america she reminded him with dignity and besides that's different a french girl now see here mother he said gravely in the first place i don't know as i have the ghost of a show with madeline his mother made an inarticulate sound expressive of extreme unbelief and even even if she even if i her father wouldn't look at me he hates everything german like poison he thinks i'm french harry smiled rather sheepishly under his mother's incredulous stare he thinks you're french she exclaimed horror-stricken what would your grandfather say rather hazily he sketched the circumstances which had resulted in the small deception what a thing for a girl to do she commented i should never have thought of it of course not agreed harry you would never have thought of it pretty clever eh i've meant to explain you know all along but hearing the old duffer rave about the war our brave compatriots and all that sort of thing i haven't done it yet cause some time or other it's your duty to tell him right away harry his mother said solemnly i'm afraid mr pilgrim would say you were a regular hypocrite you should have heard what he said about hypocrites harry it was awful harry tossed up his hat once more and then suddenly he threw his arms around his mother and stooped his tall head to her neck say ma he whispered coaxingly well harry i wish i wish you'd go and see madeline oh she's the sweetest dearest but i'm afraid she's way over my head mrs schwartz held her boy jealously fast you're too young to be thinking of such things harry it's downright foolish i'm as old as father was when you were married no i didn't realize dear dear how the time does fly it seems only yesterday that you were running around in dresses and you'll go and see her ma mrs schwartz drew a deep sigh while she patted her boy's crisp curling hair i suppose i'll have to if you oh but if her father he kissed her hurriedly oh thanks mother you're the best ever good-bye and don't worry harry walked very fast till he was well out of sight of his mother's tearful gaze then he lapsed into frowning thought which at last halted his steps in front of an inconspicuous building on the main street a flight of dusty stairs confronted him when he opened the door he mounted them still slowly a door at the top of the stairs stood ajar and a subdued clicking of typewriters filled the corridor no sir he heard someone say in what might be termed a dry business voice i don't doubt what you tell me is okay but you see we don't employ germans at the plants hyphenates or any other sort our canada folks are firm on that point a man his hat pulled low on his forehead plunged angrily down the stair harry stood aside to let him pass then he entered the door purporting to usher one into the temporary offices of the merck's munitions company 
The man with the business voice had not yet resumed his place behind his desk when Harry entered. He glanced sharply at the newcomer. Right, oh, we're advertising for a few more men, he said in answer to Harry's question. With the information, he slid an application blank across the flat top desk. Fill it in, he commanded crisply. No use wasting your time or ours. His own time, it appeared, could be used to advantage in whistling Tipperary between closed teeth. Harry vaguely recognised the tune as he examined the card. It contained spaces for the applicant's name, age, nationality, and other data supposedly pertinent to the manufacture of ammunition. <laughs> What's the matter? asked the clerk jauntily. Can't you read and write? Harry's ears turned scarlet. He wrote with fierce little jabs and dashes, and in scowling silence flipped the card into the hand waiting to receive it. The clerk nonchalantly narrowed his gaze upon it, shifting his whistle to the corner of his mouth. Henry Lanour. That what you call yourself, eh? Foreign, ain't it? I'm American born, said Harry thickly. Ah, just so. But we're being kind of particular what brand. Well, as so long as it ain't German. And you want to be a guard. Mm-hmm. Well, now you take this card out to the plant main office and ask for Mr. Mills. I've okayed it, see? A man with indignant grey eyes stood near the door, in an attitude of surprised attention, as Harry, still red and perspiring visibly, passed out, his card clutched tight in his hand. The two exchanged swift glances of appraisal. "'Where have I seen that chap?' Harry was asking himself, as he hurried away, his hat jammed low on his sweating forehead. He wanted something to divert his attention from too close a contemplation of himself. At the back of his mind there already arose a clamour of protest demanding his swift return to the recruiting office of the Merck's munitions plant. What, go back there and own up to the name of Schwartz, and let that blooming jay kick me down the stairs? he asked his boyish conscience which had received much coddling at the hands of his mother and was therefore alive and kicking. What's the harm in calling myself Lenoir, I'd like to know? Means the same as Schwartz. Both of them mean black. Henry Black, that's my name, by rights. By George, I've a good mind to change to Henry Black some time or other. I'm sick of being a hyphenate. An hour later, the good French name Henri Lenoir was set down on the payroll of the Merck's concern, at a weekly wage which would soon finish paying for Harry's building lot. In imagination, he already beheld there a half-shingled house with dormers and a red roof. The thought of Madeleine as the mistress of this modest air-castle gave the knockout blow to conscience, which finally ceased its feeble protests altogether amid the engrossing industries of the munitions plant. Late that afternoon, Harry again encountered the young fellow he had seen in the town office. He was engaged in checking up the finished product, which had already begun to be assembled in vast piles and serried ranks in the shipping warehouse. Harry, unused to thoughts of bloodshed and destruction, felt a slight shudder stiffening his blond hair at the sight of those long rows of murderous shells, but it appeared quite otherwise with the stranger. The look of anger and vague disgust, which Harry had noted in the morning, had given place to one of rapt enthusiasm. So intent was the young man upon his work that he did not glance up as Harry passed. "'That fellow's name is Hobbs,' said the man who had been deputed to coach Harry in his new duties. "'You'll find him here every day afternoon. Mornings he works in the filling shed.' Harry turned for a second look at the man who was engaged in counting the day's product with such an air of triumph, and once more that vague shiver passed along his spine. His mother met him at the door when he came home that night, tired and dusty. "'Your grandfather's here,' she said, in the suppressed voice she always used in announcing the large, authoritative presence in the splint-bottomed chair. "'And Harry?' Your father says you haven't been at the building loan office for two days. Nathan Scrimger came over to the shop to see if you were sick. 
Harry scowled. I've quit the building loan, he said sullenly. Never get anywhere working for that bunch. Got another job with a live concern. Why, Harry, exclaimed his mother. Why, Harry. He edged past her and raced up the back stairs to his room, uneasily aware of his grandfather's booming voice in the parlour. Should he face the old man and tell him what he'd done? Some sort of explanation would be required of him, he knew, probably at the supper table. It's none of grandfather's business, he told himself, as he strove to drown the dominant German gutturals in a rush of water from the faucet. I've a right to earn my living any darn way I like. I'm an American. He could hear his mother stepping briskly about the kitchen, while the tantalising odours of freshly baked biscuit and broiling ham floated up the open stairway. Harry flung his six feet of sturdy length on the banister and slid noiselessly down. Supper most ready? he inquired in a whisper. Oh, gee, that ham smells good. Harry, said Mrs. Schwartz nervously, I wouldn't get to arguing with your grandfather tonight if I were you. And Harry? Yes, mother? I called your father out to the kitchen a minute ago to pry the top off the jar of pickles, and I told him not to mention your leaving the building loan at supper. You can explain afterward. A conscience-stricken blush mounted to Harry's forehead. Mother, he said fervently, you're some brick. End of chapter 21「Chapter 22 of Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I guess, Madeline, you'd better go to the revival meeting tonight along with Ma and me, said Miss Malvina to her young neighbour. I asked your pa to go, and he says he don't want to be revived till after the war. And unless the Germans give him back Alsace, he ain't never a going to be. That's downright wicked, I says, to talk that way. I kind of felt it my duty to speak right out. Your immortal soul, I says, has got to be saved, no matter how the war turns out. Just like that, I says it to him. Then I shrugged my shoulders and says, May Namport, meaning in your lingo, but I don't know as it's any of my funeral. I thought I should die laughing to see his face. Why, Miss Malvina, says he, I hope it would matter much to you. To think of him understanding my French. You are sure progress fine and dandy, said Madeleine complacently. Me aussi, I speak English easy as log from roll. Miss Malvina bent double with cackling laughter. Oh, that ain't right, she corrected her pupil. You want to say as easy as rolling off a log. Oh, <laughs> but I guess by rights I ought to be more solemn like, seeing as we're going to a meeting tonight. Me and Ma'll call for you in plenty of time. They say seats is scarce after eight o'clock. As teeth of hen, inquired Madeline. Oh, you don't always have to put in the hen every time you speak of things being scarce, replied Miss Malvina kindly. Though there ain't anything scarcer in hen's teeth as far as I know. The little dressmaker had composed her face to a proper seriousness by the time she and Ma Bennett arrived at Monsieur Desaye's door that evening. The Frenchman, in the easy dishabille of his frogged velvet coat, received them with his wonted ceremonious politeness. Ah, Madame, bonsoir, and Miss Malvina, honour me by entering my humble home. That is very nice word, home. You have made it home by entering, mes chers amis. Mrs. Bennet submitted awkwardly to having her hand kissed, and then, seated in a large crimson cushioned fauteuil, she gazed through her far-sighted specks at the strange metamorphosis of Miss Philura Rice's front parlour. The rugs, the pictures, the dim splendours of leather-bound books, the curious bits of faience afforded the old lady a singular satisfaction. 
as she had frequently expressed it to her daughter i could sit all day a looking at the mess of things in that house on the present occasion absorbed in vague contemplation of her surroundings she paid small heed to the conversation between her daughter and m de say madeleine she understood had been late in clearing away the supper dishes she would be down tout de suite a phrase ma bennett interpreted uncertainly as referring to madeleine's youthful beauty so far as ma is concerned miss malvina was saying she don't need no revivin there never was a pieser woman than ma bennett in this ere veil o tears she went to church reg'lar rain and shine for more than fifty years and as far as funerals and like that there couldn't nobody be more faithful always settin in the front row by the remains i remember being took to funerals when i wa'n't no bigger than a grasshopper but ma used to say it never took the laugh out o me <laughs> i remember tea heein right out at old miss bascom's funeral and ma had to carry me out oh, she warmed me good for that i can tell you miss malvina was appropriately clad in her sunday best henrietta cloth dress with the purplish black of her best hair front carefully disposed under the brim of a black straw hat adorned with jaded flowers m Dessay secretly deplored his neighbour's costume more particularly the hair front which concealed as he knew snow-white locks of persistent curliness he listened attentively to miss malvina's remarks making mental notes of several unfamiliar idioms to be looked up later at present he had in mind an inquiry which related itself to miss malvina's bright eyes and piquant gestures you have lived always in america he asked you are a native n'est-ce pas well i don't know as i ever thought myself as a native they're mostly coloured like indians and such but i was born right in this here town so was ma we're real old-timers anyway the bennetts is and i guess the de boises was too that's ma's folks ma's name was henriette de bois before she married pa bennett miss malvina pronounced the maternal cognomen de bois with a strong accent on the final syllable she was astonished at the effect of her words upon her listener madame your mother was called henriette he cried it is francaise appelée oh, a spell for me that du bois it is du bois eh henriette du bois allons now i understand enfin i have perceived miss malvina stared hmm, du bois is spelt d u b o i s she said but it wa'n't never pronounced bois as i know of ma oh, listen here ma yes malviny murmured the old lady roused from a rapt contemplation of a certain carved tabaret covered with faded tapestry wa'n't your folks real americans demanded her daughter they wa'n't none of em foreign born was they mrs bennett's dim eyes brightened to something like animation i remember hearing my father say his folks come from the other side she said i guess pa was some foreign i know he used to get all het up cause folks never spoke his name right but us children didn't mind and after us girls got married we never thought no more about it there wa'n't no reason to be particular whether it was du bois or du bois as pa used to call it Monsieur de say arose with an air of solemnity he bowed low before ma bennett heels together hand upon his heart madame henriette dubois bennett said he with magnificent disdain for the uncompromising bennett mes félicitations you are of my country by extraction ma bennett emitted a little cackle of remonstrance at the touch of his bearded lips upon her forehead but by virtue of that chaste salute she had become forever enshrined as it were in those inner fastnesses of m de say's affections reserved for compatriots alone to miss malvina he said nothing being apparently absorbed in a contemplation of ma's faded lineaments 
for land's sake exclaimed the little dressmaker with a sort of awe to think of my bennet being french m desaye turned quickly around ma chere amie he murmured you are also one of us uh, i knew it not for nothing those gestures those expressions piquantes you are francaise all francaise well i don't know as i care if i be chirruped miss malvina joyously a body might be a sight worse off i guess <laughs> but what creation will mrs deaconess buckthorn say madeline who had entered the room unnoticed observed the excited demeanour of the three elderly persons with the surprised compassion of youth to be old to wear a false front and an ugly hat seemed to her incompatible with jubilance of any sort she betrayed little surprise when informed of the momentous discovery c'est la même chose she murmured as she kissed miss malvina's cheek and spread a graceful curtsey before madame henriette dubois bennett to whom her father presented her with embrassement no more i can love you than before but if my father he love you better then i am happy as tied at high clam oh you'll kill me yet madeleine vowed miss malvina your talk's a regular hasty puddin oh but sakes alive we won't get no seats if we don't make tracks for the church End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of neighbours by florence morse kingsley this librivox recording is in the public domain miss bennett's apprehensions were well founded the church was already filled to overflowing when they arrived but mr henry pratt in the role of a zealous usher thought there might be a few choice seats in the choir he had been instructed he told miss malvina with a secular chuckle to fill such vacancies with sinners on the stroke of eight oh, go along with you henry pratt chided miss malvina indignantly ain't you ashamed to talk with that way to ma bennett and me if we're sinners i'd like to know what in creation you be there was a loud chorus in progress goaded to quickened repetition by the energetic young man occupying a conspicuous soap-box between choir and congregation that's the evangelist regular singer jim baldwin miss malvina explained to madeleine as the three ladies followed mr pratt's brisk lead to the platform they say he used to be a street-car conductor i guess you could hear him holler from here to boston <laughs> he's just grand for a revival madeleine was still very much in the dark as to the nature and purpose of a revival when she took her seat next to a pink-cheeked girl who was singing loudly out of a paper-covered song-book the erstwhile street conductor's stentorian tones penetrated the tide of song come wake up there can't you put some pep into your singing now then open up everybody and let her fly to the glory of god better pretend to sing even if you can't whispered the pink-cheeked girl baldy won't stand for it to see folks sitting in the front row with their mouths shut but madeline timidly shook her head she was wishing she had not come to the revival with miss malvina and ma bennett who looking unnaturally pale and solemn in their black clothing were seated on the opposite side of the platform but she was temporarily relieved from apprehension when the young man got down from his soap-box and the evangelist rose to speak for a while madeleine strove to understand what the man was saying in his monotonously loud hoarse voice she thought he must be very angry with every one present for he shook his fists banged the books on the desk and when in a climax of fiery denunciation he climbed nimbly to the very top of the pulpit she involuntarily clutched at the pink-cheeked girl what is the matter with that man she asked me i think i am a lamb shh warned the other girl conscious of the watchful regard of mr baldwin madeline's startled eyes were gradually finding friends in the congregation in a pew near the front 
sat their proprietaire mrs pettibone she did not appear alarmed the girl perceived though her face wore the tense strained expression which seemed to have communicated itself from the speaker to his audience madeleine had vaguely understood from miss malvina's previous explanations that the revival was a special sort of religion it was difficult she thought to understand religion and more particularly the religion of america in france it appeared to associate itself with shadowy peaceful old churches with sunshine mellowed by immemorial stained glass streaming in across kneeling worshippers and with the snowy veils and wreaths of one's first communion in the world it meant doing small deeds of kindness and keeping the heart pure from guile madeleine's wandering gaze roved from one troubled intent face to another till at last it rested with pleased surprise upon harry schwartz sitting next to the rail on the opposite side of the platform a faint blush stole into the girl's cheeks as she passed in swift review their meeting of yesterday i think of nothing but you all day long harry had said as he held her hand at parting and madeleine somehow understood the english words perfectly she wondered if harry was thinking of her now as he sat motionless his head supported upon his hand which partly concealed his face she had seen harry almost every day of late always by chance of course and sometimes for the briefest of moments it was most desirable indeed necessary for one's health to take the air in the cool of the morning or better yet in the cool of the evening and it was singular how often one chanced to meet one's friends bent on similar errands of refreshment that queer mr hobbs too who spoke french whenever she would permit mr hobbs had come quite boldly to call upon her father soon after their small adventure and had been received by m desaye with marked favour on such occasions madeleine sat unobtrusively silent listening to the conversation which as a matter of course concerned itself with the war m desaye and young hobbs had quickly found a common ground in their keen regret at being personally absent from the great conflict then both men had glanced guardedly at madeleine as if in her quiet presence each found a satisfying reason for his conduct madeleine still found the young englishman intéressant but only once had she compared him in the privacy of her thoughts with harry there were no further french lessons now that harry was working in the munitions plant and it was just at this point of their common labour that she had been led to think of the two young men at one and the same moment mr hobbs was working at the manufacture of shrapnel because he wanted to kill germans but harry was working for her he had told her so both in french and in english his french was of a frightfulness to be sure but his english left large loopholes for the imagination i'm going to build a bang-up house on my lot he informed madeleine and don't you forget it little girl you're going to live in that house some day that's why i changed my job i'm out for the simoleons for fair simoleons was a long and difficult word for money madeleine learned the very much soiled american money was likewise called cash bucks rocks as well as dollars it was all very puzzling yet her thoughts lingered about the novel idea of harry actually building a house she had shaken her head over his odd notion that she should ever live in that house but you will some time he urged please say yes i not like that word yes she objected an elusive sparkle in her eyes never do i speak yes it is not a nice word say we oui, then boldly urged harry we oui, us and company is a dandy idea was harry thinking about his house she wondered as he sat his head on his hand apparently oblivious to the thunders of oratory from the pulpit but no it could not be with that expression of keen anxiety almost of pain 
why was he so still as if frozen into rigid immobility her girlish curiosity was rapidly merging into anxiety when suddenly as if all at once aware of the soft fire of her gaze the young man looked up their eyes met an innocent smile dimpled at the corners of madeleine's lips for a thrilling instant he watched her his troubled eyes full of the question which had been tormenting him under the spell of the evangelist's preaching he had been considering his monstrous fraud in assuming the name lenoir he had known all along that it was questionable that he should have explained himself and his paternity to madeleine's father and now he was using it to gain money or for her all for her but was it honest money mr pilgrim had chosen the subject of honesty with god and man as the topic of his sermon that night with unsparing hand he had stripped off the multicoloured rags of hypocrisy and deceit with which sinning humanity strives to cover its nakedness a wayfaring man though a fool could furnish no valid excuse for not understanding the purport of mr pilgrim's discourse the entire congregation with the exception of madeleine whose engrossing thoughts in fluent french shut out all save the sound of the preacher's voice realized themselves glissading down a slippery incline leading to fiery death and thus it was that harry his stupefied conscience once more awake and loudly seconding the sermon beheld only one way of escape he must presently stumble to his feet and before all the staring eyes of the village must somehow compass the distance between his shaky camp chair and the open space before the pulpit reserved for those under conviction he must confess his sins particularly those of omission to some one any one there was no other way by which to save his soul from that eternity of poignant misery which yawned beneath his very feet the reproaches humiliation and obloquy which would assuredly follow upon the heels of his confession seemed of little moment to harry compared with the blessed relief of once more facing his future with unabashed eyes he must he would be saved at any sacrifice of pride or passion in token of this momentous decision harry once more raised his head and straightened his bowed shoulders his eyes were searching the crowded room for his mother's face she would be horrified he knew at the revelation of his crime his deceit appeared no less than a crime to harry in his excitement but she would be happy when then all at once his heart leapt to his throat some potent force had drawn his questing gaze to the chairs opposite to madeline's face with its soft rose and the melting fire of dark eyes madeline smiled after all what was there to confess he had committed no sin worthy of an unthinkable hades had madeline not given him his name like a knight of old he would wear his lady's favour in the battle of modern existence it was a glorious thought the loud singing waxed and waned obeying the imperious baton of the young man on the soap-box harry's lusty young baritone swelled the chorus he felt joyously light and free as he watched the reluctant progress of persons from all parts of the house toward that small cleared space before the pulpit the evangelist was stooping forward to grasp the hands outreached to his his lean face flushed with the triumph of hard-won victory that's right that's right he was saying over and over when the slow procession of repentant sinners appeared to linger on julie he again leapt to his feet by turns pleading cajoling threatening the personal workers under the whip and spur of his stinging rebukes redoubled their efforts harry watched impersonally the majestic approach of mrs deaconess buckthorn as she mounted the wooden steps of the platform then he glanced once more at madeline who stood gazing at the confused scene with the wide-eyed amazement of a child he saw the pink-cheeked girl stoop to whisper in her ear saw madeline's puzzled smile and a sort of fierce indignation surged up within him 
it was as if some ignorant blunderer had ruthlessly broken the innocent sleep of childhood darling he muttered to himself she doesn't understand a word of this farce why should she then he became aware that mrs buckthorn had come to a standstill at his side her eyes between opposing folds of flesh were fixed tearfully upon him my dear young friend she said i've been watching you all through that blessed sermon and thinks i harry schwartz is a sinner under conviction if ever i see one praise the lord let me take you by the hand and lead you to the ark of safety harry shook off the moist fat hand which sought to enfold his own oh i, I guess you're mistaken he muttered i'm all right oh my dear boy don't put it off entreated mrs buckthorn if there's anything holding you back any darling sin that's got a hold of you do repent before it's too late but harry pushed rather rudely past the lady he wanted more than anything else to take madeline away from jim baldwin who appeared to be urging her forward almost by force the girl glanced up at harry with a sigh of relief as he gained her side oh i like best to depart from this so strange place she murmured plaintively me i am not a devote no to be a religious i will not i find miss malvina and go home quick to my father great heavens man can't you see she doesn't know enough english to understand what you're saying demanded harry roughly leave her alone will you mr baldwin stared angrily at the intruder you'd better hit the trail yourself young man was his trenchant advice before the trail hits you see harry's sole reply consisted in a well-conducted retreat never you mind miss malvina he said to madeline i'll take you home all right End of chapter 23「That same evening Mr. Kitchener Hobbs had also attended the services in Mr. Pettibone's church. He had done so for a good yet simple reason, entirely disassociated with religious convictions of any sort. Mrs. Pettibone had asked him very sweetly to come the little lady was walking slowly along the street pushing the perambulator before her enthroned in this luxurious vehicle and quite pink and complacent young master pettibone viewed the passing show which consisted at the moment of a muddy farm wagon a yellow dog frisking ahead with extravagant demonstrations of joy and a single rather grimy pedestrian this person would have hurried past without a show of recognition had not mrs pettibone stopped him why mr hobbs she said how do you do the young man touched his cap respectfully he did not wish to stop and talk with mrs pettibone but he appeared to have no choice in the matter don't you think the baby has grown she demanded proudly he'll soon be six months old the young englishman affected to examine the infant with surprise he was a thorough gentleman as was the illustrious soldier whose name he bore he's jolly well grown since i saw him last he agreed with gratifying sincerity and is that the dog we chased the day you exchanged your slippers mrs pettibone mrs pettibone beamed rosily upon mr hobbs to think of his recalling the trifling circumstance so precisely he must really be a remarkable young man she'd speak to mr pettibone about him in the meantime she must not forget his immortal soul it's the very same dog she told him oh he's the most intelligent animal and he loves the baby having exchanged these amenities mr hobbs appeared about to pass on oh <coughs> faltered the minister's wife I, I just wanted to ask you are you attending the revival services at the church mr hobbs shook his head he seldom went out of an evening he said 
oh but um mrs pettibone's face had crimsoned painfully with the effort she was making to do her duty if you haven't you really ought you know every one ought to don't you think one should be quite sure the young man looked honestly puzzled quite sure he repeated yes of being saved oh but i never could speak to anyone properly about their souls as of course i ought to being a minister's wife mrs pettibone was quite breathless by now she clutched the handle of the perambulator so tightly that her knuckles showed white through the skin mr hobbs blushed youthfully oh, I, i'm sure i ought to thank you he said but really oh, please promise me you'll go to the meeting tonight she persisted still breathlessly i am afraid i'm not a good worker in the church oh but if you he was surprised to see tears glistening on her sparse lashes i promised mr pilgrim she added dejectedly and now i've tried but if you oh i'll come to your church if you'd like me to he said quickly i shan't mind really her gratitude was touching young hobbs got away from it hastily still he had promised to attend the meeting and being a man of his word he found himself in a rear pew as the church bell ceased its urgent appeals he listened with serious attention to the sermon and the singing in the light of his thoughts it was unfortunate that to elder george trimmer had been assigned the task of speaking to the unconverted and backsliders in that section of the congregation where young hobbs was seated the conversation between the two men was brief and pointed at its conclusion the erstwhile shoe clerk of the trimmer emporium with a bitter smile upon his lips strolled out to the vestibule he had seen madeline enter with miss malvina and ma bennett and the thought of himself walking home with her in the cloudy darkness of the autumnal evening soothed his ruffled feelings through the open door of the church he saw that a light rain was falling and congratulated himself on his forethought in bringing an umbrella it seemed a long time before he saw her coming through the swinging door closely followed by a tall young man with indeterminate features and a ruddy complexion he'd seen him before he knew also for no reason whatever he disliked the fellow even before he perceived his arrogant assumption of proprietorship in madeline good evening miss madeleine said kitchener hobbs in french affecting not to see her companion it is raining but fortunately like a true londoner i fetched my umbrella you will let me take you home the girl blushed with girlish embarrassment you are of a politeness she murmured but you will excuse most kindness pa it is raining quite fast particularized mr hobbs still unconscious of the masculine presence at madeleine's side harry schwartz scowled blankly at the wet shining pavements and the wet dripping foliage then his eyes brightened in an umbrella stand near the door he spied the means of escape i have an umbrella he said calmly possessing himself of a large substantial article bearing the name buckthorn prominently displayed upon its handle he assured his badly abused conscience that he would return it before mrs buckthorn had finished her pious labours within upon mr hobbs he bestowed a single glance of defiance perhaps we'd better hurry along he suggested to madeline then i'll hustle back with an umbrella for miss malvina and the old lady madeline hesitated to avoid wounding a friend while declining a kindness required one's savoir-faire miss derob she began with a bewitching glance of entreaty i am very much hope you are not mad with me but i have honour to tell you mr schwartz take me home you are acquainted with him n'est-ce pas the two young men stared at each other 
with a slight very slight stiffening of their spinal processes in their eyes shone the primeval glint of the male animal madeleine was vaguely alarmed very nice person monsieur le noir she murmured very much you like him miss derobe i didn't catch your name sir said kitchener hobbs my name is schwartz snapped harry and then he suddenly grew pale haven't i seen you at the plant inquired mr hobbs unpleasantly circumstantial harry controlled himself with an effort hm, I, I work there he said madeleine had retreated to the door of the audience room from whence issued triumphant bursts of song oh i, I think it best i wait for miss malvina she murmured her eyes wide with apprehension i quite agree with you said mr hobbs deliberately turning his back upon harry miss bennett might be alarmed at not finding you harry's heart was pounding furiously in his scarlet ears look here he said thickly addressing himself to his rival who asked you to butt in mr hobbs assumed as well as he was able the expression of lord kitchener after his return from khartoum he did not appear to have understood the rude question i think you will not have long to wait he said to madeleine in her own language which to his angry antagonist sounded precisely like the flawlessly unintelligible speech of m de say harry all his teuton and revolutionary blood suddenly rising to the boiling point with love and fury closed in upon mr hobbs he had not been so angry since a boy in the third grade of the public school had called him sissy because his mother had persisted in sparing his yellow curls on that occasion young harry had fallen fearlessly upon the aggressor though he was twice his size and beaten him unmercifully you didn't answer me he stated hoarsely in unpleasant proximity to mr hobbs's ear no and i don't intend to replied mr hobbs disdainfully you're the sort of bounder a gentleman doesn't recognize at this psychological instant madeleine's quick wits prevented a continuation of hostilities which might have resulted disastrously on the very threshold of the revival she laid her hand lightly on harry's sleeve beneath which bulged angry muscles oh, very much obliged she said sweetly you are most friendly and of a politeness oui? uh, me i present to you one thousand thanks we wait for madame dubois bennett and miss malvina yes into the final word which she had declined to utter only the day before at his entreaty the girl managed to convey such coaxing sweetness such alluring charm that harry felt his rage suddenly vanish like a wind-blown mist all right he murmured his honest blue eyes beaming down upon her anything you say goes sure it does she made haste to agree you are my friend of a right deadness très bien and then upon the smart of mr hobbs resentment she poured the balm of her smile oh how i am glad for very nice umbrella she warbled miss malvina aussi and madame her ma snug as a bug in the rug all every one with such great kindness of our friends mr hobbs regained his presence of mind at a single bound charmed i'm sure to be of some small service he said with a bow which would have gained him recognition in hyde park permit me he pressed his umbrella into madeline's hand and was gone into the rainy night before she could utter a remonstrance perhaps it was fortunate that miss malvina and ma bennett came hurriedly forth at that moment miss malvina's cheeks were flushed her eyes bright well i declare madeline she exclaimed so that's what's become o you harry schwartz you ought to be in there settin with the mourners this minute i seen you take madeline away just as jim baldwin was a labourin with her she wanted to go home harry excused himself inadequately a poor excuse is better'n none 
re retorted Miss Malvina. If it hadn't a been for Ma, I don't know but what I'd a joined him with the backsliders. But Ma didn't catch much of what he was saying. Oh, and besides, she got a pain in the small of her back from setting so long in that pesky camp chair. And then along comes Henry Pratt and had the nerve to ask Ma and me to hit the trail. Why, who's got on a trail, Malviny? says Ma, innocent. Oh, I thought I should die. Mr. Sign Painter Pratt, I says severe. If you'd a took that sermon in, I says, you wouldn't be talking no such nonsense to Ma Bennett. You ain't worthy to unbutton her shoes, I says, and I'd like it to sink deep in your ears, speaking of the subject of the sermon, I says, which was honesty, that the paint on my dressmaking sign is peeling off already, and me a paying a dollar and seventy-five cents for it less than six months ago. You go down on that trail, Henry, I says, and see if you can't get a hold of a brand of religion that'll make you mix your paint with linseed oil instead of kerosene. Quite unabashed by this pointed exposition on common honesty, Harry spread the buckthorn umbrella over Madeline, while Miss Malvina and Ma went on before, under the shelter so kindly loaned by Mr. Hobbs. "'Wasn't it nice of him to think of two old women like me and Ma?' floated back to the two young people over Miss Malvina's shoulder. "'I'll bet a dollar Oddie Hobbs'll get a star in his crown for that.' "'What is star in crown?' propounded Madeline, striving to pierce the gloom of Harry's demeanour. "'I never saw one of them, replied Harry dejectedly, "'and I guess I never will now.' "'Will I ever see one of those crowning stars?' persisted the girl. "'You like them, eh?' "'They look dandy on you,' sighed Harry. "'But I hope you won't get one for a long time yet. "'Say, Madeleine, there's something I want to ask you.' "'Très bien, yes.' A cold trickle from the buckthorn umbrella, winding deviously down the back of his collar, still further depressed the sinking barometer of Harry's feelings. There's a lot of things I want you to tell me. I've got to know them or go up the spout. All right, the girl encouraged him. Say, do you think it's square for me to go on being called Lenoir? On the level now, have I any right to that name? Madeline pondered the proposition, expressed in terms of two dimensions, with care. "'What is square?' she inquired cautiously. "'Is that a nice word, square?' "'If I could jab a French like that nervy chap Hobbs, I could explain in a jiffy,' he growled deep in his throat. "'In a jiffy? An automobile? Oui, I understand. Oh, hang it!' I didn't say jitney, protested Harry. Look here, Madeline, we'll cut out the figures of speech for once and try to get down to brass tack so you'll savvy, see? Brass tack, oui, très bien. Do you remember when you introduced me to your father, votre father? You know, you didn't want him to catch on that I was German. Well, of course I ain't. I'm American clear to the backbone, and I'll knock the spots out of any cheap sports who dares to say I ain't. I'm American all right, but I've got a Deutsch name. Heinrich Schwartz. I don't care. It's a blamed good name, and it's an American name because I'm one. And what's more, it's going to be an American name for I don't know how long. Harry paused. Impressed with the spotless pages of American history embellished with the name of Heinrich Schwartz, which seemed suddenly unrolled before him. It's time all this darn nonsense about names was wiped out, he stated with some violence. Why isn't Schwartz as good as black or Lenoir? I'm blamed if it ain't. But I guess I've put my foot in it by translating it into blooming Belle Francaise. If that British chap should give me away at the plant... You call yourself Le Noir at plant? asked Madeleine. 
suddenly pouncing on the crux of the matter like a preternaturally bright kitten. Yes, admitted Harry reluctantly. They were turning away applicants with German names. I wanted the job. You know why. If you don't, I'll tell you again. I want you to marry me as soon as I earn enough to build my house. I love you, Madeleine. Harry's voice was scarcely audible as he made his final fateful statement. It seemed to him that he had shouted it from the housetops. Every lighted window glimpsed through vistas of dripping foliage appeared to be spying upon him with stealthy enjoyment. His heart thumped loudly in his ears as he waited for her answer. But Madeleine, it seemed, was still pondering his initial question. Ought he to call himself Le Noir in order to earn money? This much she had comprehended clearly. I think I ask my father, she said at last. I explain all to him, then I tell to you. You like me to explain, n'est-ce pas? Then you do. Oh, Madeleine! Harry's further utterance was choked with rapture, but he managed to possess himself of her hand, which he squeezed fervently. But I guess it's up to me to face the music, he added dubiously. She had withdrawn the squeezed hand with a little cry. Oh, oh did I hurt you? he inquired penitently. I'm so happy, I guess I didn't realise. Oh, say, Madeline, did you mean it? Her upturned face in the strong radiance of a swinging arc light was so lovely that he yearned to kiss it, but the puzzled pucker between her brows deflected him from his purpose. I can never be sure just how much you take in of what I'm saying, he complained. Darn it! If I'd only worked harder while I had the chance, I might have been able to parley vous by now. Come to think, I do know the first part of one verb. J'aime. Savez j'aime, Madeleine? To his dismay, she burst into ringing mirth. Oh, you are most funny, Harry, she told him. Oh, quick, I die laughing. Funny, he echoed. Then you think it's a joke when a man asks you to marry him, do you? That's what I'm trying to say. I want you for my wife. Do you know what wife means? His face changed subtly from the inchoate good looks of the boy to the stern masterfulness of the man bent toward her. Do you? he urged. She shook her head airily. I think best you étudier le dictionnaire français, she said. Enfin, I understand more quick. Her eyes, bright as stars in the uncertain light, told him nothing. All right, he said doggedly. I'll get busy. There's a few words I'm going to make you understand if I study all night. Merci one thousand, my friend. Me, I also study my dictionnaire anglais, and I find all those strange words, those wife and to marry him. You like me to do it, Harry? Madeleine! But already they'd reached the gate of Miss Filiora's little house, which had once swung wide to the sober, middle-aged wooing of the Reverend Silas Pettibone, and she had passed quickly inside. Those parapluies, she reminded him, you are obliged to take him. Oh, that's right, he exclaimed. A vision of the outraged Mrs. Buckthorn, vainly searching for her umbrella, adding itself to the sum total of his discomfiture. As he sprinted down the street, he could hear Madeline's high, sweet call of greeting and farewell to Miss Malvina, who had evidently been watching for her safe arrival. "'Confound it!' murmured Harry, vaguely displeased with Miss Malvina, the world at large, and most of all with himself. End of chapter 24 Chapter Twenty Five of Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. As was entirely natural, Mr. Hobbs called for his umbrella on the following evening. He
he did not he explained to m desaye wish to put any one to the trouble of returning the parapluie which he was only too happy to have had with him for the service of the ladies m desaye knew of no such umbrella he searched among his own without success but would not m hobbs do him the honour of entering his humble abode his daughter madeleine who was at the moment visiting their amiable neighbour mademoiselle dubois bennett might know about the umbrella and this put him in mind of the singularly interesting discovery he had made with regard to miss malvina's ancestry it was pleasant to be able to relate the piquant incident in his own tongue which the young englishman understood without difficulty and so for the better part of an hour the father of madeleine discoursed at length on the amazing tout ensemble of the so-called american born of many nations and yet resembling none even the german american m desaye pulled a wry face at the hyphenate word frequently exhibited small traces of his deplorable teuton blood did m hobbs par exemple number any such person among his acquaintance mr hobbs hesitated here was the appropriate dagger its handle toward his hand should he use it was it not indeed his duty to warn the unworldly father of madeleine that a certain bounder he could think of no other descriptive adjective for the rude and bucolic harry a german never mind the american even now threatened his domestic peace his newly acquired sense of duty and the stern kitchener code of honour struggled together for an instant he determined upon a safe middle course far be it from a kitchener hobbs to meanly retaliate upon his rival but to instil a proper amount of caution into the receptive mind of m desaye need not collide with the strictest manual of deportment <clears throat> well i uh, since you ask me sir i will say that i do know such a person <clears throat> young hobbs grew uncomfortably hot inside his starched collar how was he to convey the much-needed warning without actual hypocrisy m desaye eyed him intently ah he ejaculated softly and what pray do you think of him i don't like him sir said mr hobbs sternly naturellement agreed the frenchman with a shrug kitchener hobbs frowned at his boots which were impeccably polished then suddenly his brow cleared he had determined upon a bold course one which would give him the right to speak unreservedly to the father of madeleine the fact is sir he blurted out i love your daughter i hope you have no objections you love my daughter and you are hope i've no objection m desaye's tone was carefully modulated his smile might even be construed as encouraging i'm not rich modestly admitted mr hobbs but i'm clean and honest i'm an englishman my mother is american allons you are also of that melange tant bon que mauvais the englishman reddened angrily better english american than german american he said stiffly but why either inquired m desaye pleasantly impersonal i return to france my daughter also enfin she marries a frenchman it is my purpose you forget that your daughter is beautiful and that she's unprotected from the advances of even germans in a country where as you say the good and the bad are mixed in pretty even proportions it was m desaye's turn to redden angrily you will of your goodness explain yourself monsieur he said with ominous politeness do you chance to know a fellow who calls himself le noir asked hoddy hobbs casting altruism and the kitchener code to the winds Henri Lenoir, or young, eh, of a ruddy complexion? Certainly, 
I have attempted to teach him French. Did you succeed, sir? Monsieur Desay drew his brows together. Many things recurred to his agile memory. He linked them swiftly into one sinister whole. Ah, he exhaled lightly between closed teeth. You are telling me that young man is... I have been duped, deceived. What is it you say? His name, stated Kitchener Hobbs distinctly, is Schwartz, Heinrich Schwartz. He told me so himself. He somehow managed to win the confidence of your daughter. And you ought to know it, sir. He walked home with Madeleine last night. Dead silence followed these correlated statements. The father of Madeleine opened and closed his sinewy fingers two or three times, while the veins on his forehead swelled visibly. But he did not burst into excited recriminations. His eyes, very bright and rather unpleasant to contemplate, were fixed immovably upon an odd bit of faience representing a Dutch woman in a winged cap carrying balanced water jugs. Uh, <coughs> I fancy I've made a bally ass of myself, stammered Kitchener Hobbs, hating the Dutch woman with ardour. But I, I thought it seemed to me. Monsieur Desay arose. Monsieur, he said, permit me to thank you. Ah, regrettable, you cannot of your goodness pay me a longer visit. Bonsoir, monsieur. Good night. His smile was pervasive, irresistible. Young Hobbs found himself wafted, as it were, on waves of good will and friendly cordiality to the front door, which closed gently, very gently, behind him. Outside in the cool darkness, Mr. Hobbs took brief counsel with himself. Confound a Frenchman, anyway, he muttered, and permitted himself a brief, though refreshing, interval of impersonal criticism. Every Briton is, of course, aware of the inherent insincerity of the French character. Slippery being the favourite descriptive adjective. One never knew where to find a Frenchman, he told himself banally. Upon further reflection, during which young Hobbs passed his late conversation with Monsieur de Say in swift review, he perceived that his bold declaration of love for Madeleine had hopelessly muddled the situation. She'll hate me for telling, he concluded simply. There was but one course of action which suggested itself under existing circumstances. He resolved to follow it. Miss Malvina opened the door to his agitated ring. Good gracious, she exclaimed as she recognised her visitor. If it ain't you, Oddie Hobbs, who walk right in, do? Mr. Hobbs inwardly resented Miss Bennett's familiar use of his mother's undignified abbreviation of the magnificent Horatio Herbert. He detested the name Hoddy, but he walked in, aware of Madeline's light laugh in the room beyond. "'I got your umbrella all safe,' said Miss Malvina. "'My, I don't know what we'd have done without it, with Ma's room and tis and all.' It certainly was real sweet of you to remember Ma and me. I was just saying to Madeline, there ain't many young fellows, I says, would give us a thought. She stood on tiptoe to whisper in his ear, I put in a good word for you, Hardy. Oh, my, ain't she a lovely girl. But you'll have to watch out, or Harry Schwartz'll cut you out. He's an awful nice boy, Harry is. I knowed him since he was in dresses, prettiest little fella you ever see, with yellow curls down on his shoulders and the pinkish cheeks. Oh, my. <clears throat> I wish to speak to Mr. Say, said Mr. Hobbs stiffly. I was told she was here. I want to know, wondered Miss Malvina. Her pa must have told you. She just run in for a couple of minutes to bring Ma some gaiters. That's what she calls them little cakes with a raisin on top. Here's your umbrella and your hat right on top of it so as you can't forget it. Come to bow Madeline home, you'll be so excited you'll likely forget you ever owned one. 
Madeleine blushed when she beheld the pale, stern face of Kitchener Hobbs. He had an air of mastery about him which caused a vague but agreeable shiver to pass over her. " Speak of angels," announced Miss Malvina joyously, " an' you'll catch the flutter o' their wings. Wa'n't we a jest talkin' about Hoddy Hobbs? Set right down clos't t' Ma, Hoddy, so 't she c'n hear what you're sayin'. An' I was tellin' 'em what a nice, neat boy you was, never givin' your ma any trouble. ..." But Mr. Hobbs declined the chair Miss Malvina kindly cleared of sewing materials for him. Madeleine had retreated toward the door with a murmured explanation which concerned her father, alone and missing her. " Oh, I guess your pa c'n git along without you f'r a spell longer," protested Ma Bennett. " Don't go yit awhile." Miss Malvina winked knowingly at Ma. She had witnessed the exchange of glances between Hoddy Hobbs and Madeleine with a youthful quickening of her own pulses. " Why, Ma," she said, after she had closed the front door on the two, " if you wa'n't blinder 'n a bat you c'd see you was a payin' attention t' Mad'lane. Didn't you take notice how red she got when he come in? An' he fairly et her up with his eyes." Miss Malvina sighed plaintively. " My! It must be awful nice t' be young an' han'some an' have a beau. I don't know as I ever had one." " Oh, yes, you did, too, Malviny," contradicted Ma. " Don't you r'member? The' was Obed Salter." " Oh, yes," scoffed Miss Malvina. " Obed come home with me from pra'r meetin' once, after his first wife died. I wouldn't look at that old widower no more'n I c'd fly. No, sir, not if he was the last man on earth." " An' the' was a feller named Peck," went on Ma eagerly. " He was "" The' ain't no use in rakin' up them old memories," interrupted Miss Malvina almost pettishly. " I got an autograph album up in the attic. I r'member we passed it 'round in school, an' all the boys wrote opposite the girls they liked best. George Beels wrote opposite me; then he went off an' courted Hattie Meyers. ... But, my goodness, I'd no more 'a' married Undertaker George Beels, not if he was the last man " The loud whir of the sewing machine drowned further reminiscences. But Miss Malvina's cheeks were almost as pink as Madeleine's when she finally drew down the shades preparatory to going to bed. There was a young moon in the sky, companioned by a single bright star. Miss Malvina sighed as she gazed. It made her think of Madeleine and Hoddy Hobbs. " My," she repeated wistfully, " it must be awful nice to be young an' have a beau." There was a light burning steadily in the window of her neighbor's house. It finally drew her eyes from a contemplation of the heavenly luminaries. " Whatever 'd he do if Madeleine was to take a notion to get married? " she asked the cat. Then she put a nail into its worn hole above the sash and shut the outer world from view, wondering as she did so what Hoddy Hobbs could be saying to Madeleine out there in the moonlight. In her youth, which seemed a great way off, Miss Malvina had never walked under moonlit trees with a young man. And now, with a curious, unaccustomed ache, she wished she had. " Just once, so I could look back and remember it," she murmured humbly, as she blew down the chimney of her kerosene lamp. But Madeleine had appeared wholly indifferent to her superior opportunities as she walked quickly down Miss Malvina's graveled path. With every light footfall, young Kitchener Hobbs beheld his immediate opportunity of putting himself right with her slipping away. If she should see her father first! Yet it seemed impossible to speak. <clears throat> oh, I, I say, he managed to murmur huskily as they reached her own gate, a short distance from Miss Malvina's. Bonsoir, said Madeleine sweetly. Quick, I made track for home. Oh, not yet. 
please i must speak to you the girl paused with a tentative air of a bird on a wind-swept bough oh madeleine i love you and i have told your father oh, but he and uh, uh, wait you must listen i've something more to tell you he strove boldly to detain her but she shut the gate between them i have now to hurry she said retreating from his questing hand you hear that horloge c'est nine heures there was no denying the brazen clang of the town clock you'd better not go into your father till you've heard what i have to say he sent after her desperately you'll be sorry if you do oh bien quick you tell i wait one minute oh, madeleine don't be so cruel if you knew how i love you it is most extraordinaire this love i love you love he love like lesson in grammaire anglaise me i not like to study no she shook her head with a tantalizing laugh madeleine why did you allow that fellow with two names to walk home with you last night demanded mr hobbs in a tone which he vainly strove to make elderly and impersonal really that sort of thing won't do why not to please oh, because oh, can't you understand that a man who deceives his employers by using an alias isn't to be trusted especially when he's a german and in a munitions factory he is not a german harry he is american very much star and stripe that harry you think i am bebe so you call him harry commented mr hobbs grimly why not heinrich that's his real name heinrich schwartz and his other name please le noir the fellow actually has the impudence to call himself le noir at the plant of course i told your father i had to do it can't you see schwartz may be a dangerous fellow young kitchener hobbs voice shook with twofold passion madeleine elusive as mist seemed about to vanish into the night hear me out he called after her you shall very much i hear you miss Malvina and my father's all oh, see so loud you are me i am not deaf as post but you seem so far away oh, listen madeleine it is because i love you because i want you to be my wife i can't bear to see you deceived by she was gone there could be no doubt of it the door opened showing an oblong of yellow lamplight and then closed for an irresolute minute he stood staring at the little old house beneath its canopy of swaying trees suppose he should storm that closed door should insist on being heard in french in english or in the absurd patois madeleine chose to speak after all what more could he say he had at least made his motives clear and from his present entrenched position as the declared lover of madeleine he would not easily be dislodged to harry schwartz he gave but a single disdainful thought he's the sort of bounder said kitchener hobbs who attempts to cover his misdeeds with the stars and stripes and calls himself an american End of chapter 25